turning on the microphone would be helpful. Okay, welcome to chapters 16 and 17. No, I'm lying to you. It's 15 and 16, as I see here. We're going to look at the ocean and we're going to look at the atmosphere. So uh, stay tuned as we go through the water and the sky. We've already talked about rocks and the land quite a bit, so we're going to talk about uh, the things that are other than land today, although the land will impact both the sky and the water, so they all work together. Uh, the picture behind me is of a wonderful beach in Santa Barbara, California. I was there just a few years ago. You can sort of see the boats in the background, and uh, the sand was actually pretty hot. As we've tested in our class, so the sand can get pretty hot. Uh, going down to the shoreline, it was pretty cool. But the air temperature around Santa Barbara is usually around 70 degrees. Uh, day and night, uh, summer and winter, it doesn't change too much because of the effect of the ocean that's there. So it's quite a nice place to visit, an even nicer place to live, according to many of my friends who live there. So if you ever get the chance to visit, please do so. There used to be a really wonderful restaurant there called the San Isidro Ranch, and it is no longer there because of the fires that are just off the coast here. And uh, unfortunately, they haven't rebuilt. But if they ever do rebuild and you ever see and ever get a chance to go there, uh, it was rated when I went there the number one restaurant in the country. Uh, and the menu prices reflected that. So they had a Chateau Latour wine that I would have loved to have had had I had $8,000 to buy the bottle. I did not have $8,000 to buy the bottle because I work at Ivy Tech, so there you go. Uh, but we still had a really nice dinner. I had uh, uh, saffron chicken, and uh, if you know anything about saffron, saffron is a spice that is actually worth more than its weight in gold. If you get a chance to eat a saffron chicken, you'll know why. So I did not pay a huge amount for that. Well, probably more than McDonald's, but less than the Chateau Latour. But let's go ahead and get on with this, the show, as they say. So let me see if I can share the screen. It's always, always a question whether or not I can do that. Earth science, the dynamic ocean. So we've talked a little bit about oceanic things before, but now we're gonna talk about how it likes to move about. That's what dynamic means. Uh, so we'll go through this, and then we'll go through the basics of the atmosphere. Then I will do chapter 17 as a separate video, and that will talk more about the atmosphere. Uh, so so here, here we go. Let's see if this will work. Uh, we have currents in the ocean, the way the water moves. We have some that are on the surface, and we have some that are below the surface. Uh, so one of the things that happens on the surface is that that's where it interacts with the atmosphere and we actually get friction that happens. So there is energy that is, is exchanged between the ocean and the atmosphere because of this. And it also results in temperature changes and evaporation. We do have a big circular patterns uh, in, in our oceans, and we call those gyres. Uh, and we have them in the North Atlantic, South Atlantic, North Pacific, South Pacific, and the Indian Ocean. The Indian Ocean is pretty much only in the southern hemisphere, uh, so we only have one. But these are related to our atmospheric circulation, and that is ultimately also related to the spin on our axis of our planet. Uh, so as we're looking at this, we can sort of see there is a big current in the North Atlantic. We're used to talking about the Gulf Stream. Uh, there is a big circular current in the South Atlantic. We have a big one in the North Pacific here, and we have a big one in the South Pacific here. Uh, notice we have surface warm waters, and we have colder waters. Those tend to sink, just like in the atmosphere. Warmer things rise and cooler things sink. And we have a main sort of push in, in the way things are going around. Notice here in the northern hemisphere, things are going in one direction, and in the southern hemisphere, they're going in the other direction. That's the Coriolis effect, where we have a, a, a clockwise and counterclockwise ways of moving in our atmosphere, and that is uh, sort of paralleled but opposite in our ocean currents. So as we are uh, looking at these, we see, again, as I just mentioned, Coriolis effect, it's deflected 
uh, and, and that's why we have them going in the, the uh, opposite directions uh, that we would have. So, so the Coriolis effect is the atmosphere, but our gyres are, are in the water. And we have our four main currents. So we've got sort of top and the two sides and the bottom as, as major currents in each of these. Ocean currents are very important for the climate of the world. Uh, the warmer water carries warmer air and warmer evaporation into the atmosphere in higher latitudes. That's true in the northern and the southern hemispheres. Then the cooler water will take some of the coolness back down to the tropical areas and keep them from overheating. So we have the northern uh, and southern, when we talk about southern, I'm talking about South Pole here, uh, cold zones keeping the tropics from overheating and we have the tropical warm areas keeping everything from freezing too much. Uh, so, so, so we have, have uh, some changes that take place in all of this here. So, so we sort of see the warm water is on the Atlantic side in South America, whereas the cold water is on the Pacific side in South America. And we can notice what's happening here. We have our mountain ranges. So the cold air hitting the mountain ranges there is going to be partially blocked from reaching all the rest of this area. This is the Amazon basin where we have the big rainforests that take place there. Uh, we have coastal upwelling, which means the cold water will sort of rise up in certain places, usually along the west coast of continents. So that was what we just saw in South America. That also happens in California, Oregon, Washington, British Columbia, Alaska. That also happens on the west coast of Europe and of uh, Africa along the way. And it brings a lot of nutrients to the ocean surface. And why is that important? Because plant life and animal life, fisheries, for example, uh, thrive in this stuff and that's where people want to live because they can make a living and they can eat that kind of stuff there. So as we sort of see here, here's a picture of Africa. We can see all of this chlorophyll concentration. So chlorophyll is part of plant life. So we can see it's really hugging the coast all the way along south and, and uh, southwestern Africa here. Uh, when we talk about the overall circulation of the ocean though we also have to keep in mind there are deep ocean currents that are going in different ways from the top surface ones and and this is in part due to the fact that we have a lot higher density we talked about that in our last uh, uh, lecture we also have an increase in uh, salinity uh, because it the the pressure on top you're you're pushing more and more and more down along the way. So we often will talk about the conveyor, the oceanic conveyors uh, there. And they, they sort of, uh, at the top, they'll be con conveying the warm water and the warm air, and then it will sink down and it will sort of circulate back down just like a conveyor belt would do on the other side of the ocean. Uh, and and uh, this links up the Atlantic and the Indian and the Pacific Oceans, and they all have one worldwide circulation pattern that takes place here. And you can see that on this map here. We see our, in general, our warmer water is going to be above, and in general, our colder water is going to be below. And they'll actually pass right by each other, over and under each other along the way. But this is the worldwide conveyor things move in different directions. Sometimes it will, this, especially over here in the Pacific, things will sort of bend up and down as, as uh, various factors cause. And uh, we, we see a, a general evening out of temperatures in our, in, on our planet. Shut this conveyor belt down and we end up having an ice age up here in North America and in Europe and and Asia, for example, because this warm stuff coming up here will no longer come up here to keep the climate from changing into something absolutely freezing. So ironically, one of the things that could happen with global warming is that we could precipitate a new ice age. When we're looking at the shorelines, we have our coastal zones, 
things happen very rapidly there. We have tides that roll in and out. We have lots of human activity that change things along the way, like the, the beachfront property that I'm showing you here in Santa Barbara. Uh, we have the shoreline, which is exactly where the water hits the land. We have the shore, which is an area which the tide rolls out, the tide rolls in. That's the shore, that whole area that's there. And the coastline extends in as far as the ocean is really affecting directly what's happening there. And uh, the coastline is, is kind of sort of uh, uh, like, like the, the, the shoreline. Uh, in, in fact, in many ways, uh, for our purposes, we can think of those as being about the same. And then the beach. We all know what the beach is, although not all beaches look like Santa Barbara's beach. Uh, some have rocks, some have lava fields. Uh, you go up to uh, uh, Iceland or you go to the, the island of Iwo Jima and you get a lot of black sand beaches and that's volcanic uh, material that's there along the way. So here we can sort of see we've got the shore, we've got the shoreline, we've got the uh, the shore, which is really the whole area from the low to the high tide. Uh, we have the coastal area and the coastline here, which is sort of what is the shoreline at high tide. Uh, so, so you can sort of see where things are in terms of that. Uh, we have a lot of activity in the ocean. We have wind and energy in addition to the motion of the ocean. And uh, we call that, of course, waves. And waves bounce up and down. Uh, at the top of the wave, it's a crest. At the bottom, it's a trough. Uh, so if you're sort of riding the wave, you see, in, especially in cartoons, people on surfboards on the top, they're, they're crest, that, that's at the crest uh, of, of the wave. And the way we measure wavelengths is we go from crest to crest or from trough to trough, top to top or bottom to bottom. And a wave period is how long it takes for one full wave. Some waves are very slow and very low. Some are re really high and can come in rather quickly along the way. And of course, a wave height is from bottom to top. And it can be dozens of feet in a major storm. Uh, so so they, it can really knock ships over. Uh, so, th so there's quite a lot uh, that goes into this, but wind speed is a primary factor as well as the length of time that the wind blows. So it's not just how fast it's going, but if it's going 20 miles an hour for 15 minutes, that's not going to affect it as much as if it's going 20 miles an hour for two hours. Uh, that, that, will, that will put more uh, energy into the system along the way. So we have wave movement. Wave movement is much more significant at the top you get to a certain level under the water and there's no real movement at all. You don't, you don't have any sense of that because we have more pressure and we have more density uh, that, that's down below. So there are some life forms that really like the, the motion and there are some that like the stability of the ocean underneath the waves. Uh, so, so individual water particles will move in a circle. So it's not one particle that's moving all the way along the waves. They're moving and it's the overall movement. It's sort of think about waves that are hitting the shore of a lake. If, if it were all the particles moving before long, all of the water would leave the lake from all of that. So it's, it's a circular pattern of what's happening. Here we can sort of see uh, as, as the waves hit the shoreline, uh, one of the things that's happening is these interlocking circles uh, that, that are uh, building up the waves become scrunched. And as they become scrunched, they, they push the wave action up. So we get much higher waves typically at the shore than we will say even just half a mile to a mile out uh, to see where it, it can seem really choppy at the shoreline, but it's not going to be that much out below. If you have higher waves, one of the things that happens is water pushes out and then comes back in, not just with the tides, but also with the, the wave function, the wave action that's there. Uh, waves will erode uh, over time. One of the things that they do is they break down rock material. This is why most beaches are sandy in, in, in the world. 
Uh, we also have uh, rock fragments and particles in the water. Uh, but we also have just the impact and pressure from the water. If, if you're sort of throwing up water against rock for a long enough period of time, sometimes this happens millions or even billions of years, uh, it's going to wear things down. Beaches are composed of whatever is being there. Uh, what we, that's why some beaches have the nice sand like in Santa Barbara. Some have volcanic material, some have dissolved rocky material. Uh, uh, different, different beaches will look different based on the material that's available there. And of course it gets washed away. Once it reaches the sandy uh, uh, level that we see here, uh, it is very susceptible to being washed away rather quickly. By rather quickly, I mean, can be in, just in a matter of years. That's happening in quite a number of places as sea levels rise. Uh, it, it's washing away beaches. So the overall sea level might only be a couple of inches higher, but that couple of inches is stealing the shoreline away and, and it's pushing the, 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 the coastline back. Uh, so material moves and, and it moves perpendicular to the shoreline. Uh, so, so we have, have uh, uh, kind of a shifting of the sands. Uh, waves arrive parallel to the shore. Uh, so, so they're always going, that you usually, uh, unless you have a jagged kind of edge on, on your shoreline, you're pr pretty much always going to see the, the waves coming up in a parallel uh, function, a parallel fraction. Uh, into the, the uh, shoreline that's there. Over time, wave erosion will straighten out an irregular shoreline. So if you have something that's sort of a, a point or a, a sort of rocky jutting out into that, the wave energy will break it apart over the course of time. Uh, so, so here, for example, uh, Rincon Point uh, in California, we can sort of see this is, is eventually going to erode away uh, because the waves are, are sort of hitting it. We can sort of see that, that they're all sort of coming in in a parallel form to the major land mass, but it's sort of being bent around that's here. Uh, so, so this is called refraction and it causes the energy to be sort of concentrated in these headland areas. And of course, the more energy that's hitting it, uh, the more it's going to erode over time. So beach drift ends up having a sort of a zigzag pattern, uh, and, and then we end up with some currents that will actually flow along with the shoreline. And that's why sometimes they'll tell you if you go a little bit too far out, there might be an undercurrent that will take you not only further out, but also down, down, down the way. So what we will see here, here's our longshore current, we have our particles of sand that are moving as they're sort of being pulled out and put in, pulled out and put in. And uh, this is uh, Oceanside, California, what's happening in this photo down here. And we can, we can actually watch over time the drifting of the shoreline. Then we have uh, the occasional rip currents. Uh, this is a, uh, a phenomenon that is very hazardous and uh, the, it, it's not just like the, 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 the longshore uh, current here, but these actually extend out and flow away from the waves. So if you get caught in these, one of the things you need to do is you need to go sort of parallel to the shoreline. If you, if you ever get caught in one, go parallel, uh, uh, sort of, sort of uh, up or down doesn't really matter, uh, but go parallel. Don't, don't just try to swim back to the shore uh, because that it's, the water is wa working against you and it's flowing in a different direction. So shoreline features include various kinds of uh, interesting phenomena, including sea arches and sea stacks, as well as cliffs and platforms. Uh, here's a wave cut platform here. So we can actually see the choppiness in the land. Uh, here we have a marine terrace uh, because a lot has been washed away, but this is on top of a more substantial rocky coast. Here we have a sea arch and a sea stack. Uh, these can be rather fun. Uh, and uh, I think I may have put the Bay of Fundy video up in an earlier module. If I haven't, uh, I will put it up in this one here. But there's an interesting arch 
in, uh, it's, it's on the east coast of Canada, where when the tide rolls in and the tide rolls out, it almost fills up the entire sea arch and then empties out the sea arch all the way down to uh, the, the ground, uh, to, to the bottom of the ocean that's there. But we can, we can sort of see these are more substantial things that will eventually wear away as the water continues to, uh, to smack up against it. Uh, there were probably other arches that reached out into these. This probably was all one solid uh, uh, promontory at one point along the way. Uh, things get deposited. We have uh, bars, uh, Baymouth bars, which is a sort of sandbar. Uh, we have a spit, uh, which is something that, that uh, sort of hooks in landward. We have barrier islands that can actually form parallel. Uh, people in Florida live on barrier islands uh, quite a bit. And then we have uh, tombolos, and tombolos are ridges of sand that connect the island to the mainland, and those can be rather fun. Uh, because you can actually build, there are monasteries in Europe that have built out on islands, and the tombolo, when the tide rolls in, is underwater, so it's on an island. But when the tide rolls out, you can walk across. Uh, so we can see here's a Baymouth bar. We can see a spit that is sort of hooking back in. Uh, here we have another one in uh, Massachusetts uh, that, that's here. Uh, and uh, this is a uh, sort of uh, popular tourist uh, town that people like to go to. Uh, the the wa water on this side is uh, calmer and choppier. The water on this side out here is going to be the Atlantic, which uh, uh, is, is going to be sort of larger and colder on that side. Uh, so, you, so you get some choppier waters in here because of the way it's moving, uh, but, but it's not as, as uh, intense uh, choppiness. When we're trying to look at the different kinds of shorelines, we keep getting different kinds of cuts and different kinds of irregularities. Uh, we have land shifting and moving all the time. Uh, so, so we classify usually based on sea level. Uh, when we're dealing with the east coast here, again, here's, here's a tumbelo, uh, here's a sea arch. Uh, that sea arch may actually disappear at high tide uh, along the way. Here's a sort of a spit that's sort of coming back in. Uh, so we can see the different different things that happen over time. Uh, this used to be an island. This got a, sort of a little buildup here, but eventually the longshore current would cut this away and push things back in. Uh, so, so things are constantly developing. When we're dealing with the Atlantic side of our country, we've got what we call a lot of submergent coast. Uh, lots of barrier islands. If you look at Florida, especially if you look at the Carolinas, North Carolina's got all of those islands over there. We've got, got uh, some, some other kinds of islands uh, uh, that, that are up in the Massachusetts area uh, and, and like Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard and other kinds of places there. Uh, so, so they tend to be long-term unstable. Uh, the Pacific Coast is in the process of forming, so we call it emergent. And uh, one of the things that, that happens quite a bit is the beaches get narrower uh, because of the, the uh, damming effect that we, we produced along the way. So shoreline erosion uh, can be affected by a lot of different things, including wind, including uh, rivers that flow into it, as well as tectonic activity. So the propensity for earthquakes, again, California, uh, uh, will, will uh, change things around quite a bit. And uh, then we have things that we can do to try to stop the, uh, uh, the, the erosion. We have seawalls, uh, which try to guard against the waves. We have breakwaters, uh, which try to uh, protect boats and, uh, in particular. Uh, and, and then we have groins, and uh, yeah, you can insert your joke here, uh, which, which are built at right angles uh, to the beaches and they're designed basically to be sand traps. Uh, but these have varying effects. Uh, there's, there's some really great ones on the Thames River, which is the main river going into London in England. They're built uh, dozens of miles away from the city uh, to keep the city from, from flooding. Uh, but even then, it becomes a problem at different times. So you can build out into uh, the, the ocean and uh, 
here we have jetties that have been uh, built and they're not built out quite into the longshore current. If you do that, you're going to need lots and lots of repairs. Uh, but, but one of the things that it tries to do is it tries to protect, especially the opposite side over here, as you can see. And, and what they have then built is a sort of a, a nice inland harbor area here. This was probably already a river that they've just expanded uh, rather than a complete uh, development. Uh, here we have uh, what, what you see are groins, and they've, they've set those up to effectively be sand traps to keep the, everything from shifting too much over time. Then we have a breakwater that was put in place at Santa Monica, not too far from Santa Barbara here. And we can see what's happened over time uh, is, is uh, we have a bulge of sand that has developed uh, as a result of this and the pier uh, interfering with the ordinary transport of, of sand down the, down the way. So one of the things that we can do instead of doing those kinds of hard permanent structures is just relocating buildings away from the beach. Don't build where it's going to fall apart. Uh, some people don't pay attention to that. Uh, so we can also add sand. It's, it's going away, bring it back, you know, uh, and there's a lot of sand out there. So you can, you can dredge uh, stuff and bring it back onto that. And then of course we have the tides. The tide rolls in, the tide rolls out, mostly due to the moon, but partly due to the sun. We rotate, we rotate at an angle, we're at 23 and a half degrees. And because of that, we bulge a little bit and the water bulges more than the solid. Uh, so, so we're not a perfect sphere. And as we are uh, going, going around our axis, uh, the moon will be at different positions throughout the months. So the high tide and low tide goes in and out. And when we're at full moons and new moons, uh, we have the sun, if it's a new moon, we have the sun, the moon, and the earth all in a row. If we're at a full moon, we have the sun, the earth, and the moon all in a row. But that means we've got all the forces pretty much in a straight line. We call that a spring tide because the gravitational forces all, all act on each other during that time period. The other times we have varying tides, so like and when the moon is perpendicular to the sun and earth, we get neap tide, and that's the first and third quarter. And this is when our daily tide changes are least. Think about it, we're going around once every day. We see the moon every day. So we're going to have a high tide whenever we see the moon. We're also going to have another high tide, which is going to be a little bit less when we're exactly opposite, so 12 hours later. So, so we're going to have two high tides and two low tides every day as we go around. Uh, and, and we call spring tide has nothing to do with the season. Sorry for the confusing terminology. Whenever the moon and the earth are in a straight line going to the sun. We have a neap tide whenever the moon is perpendicular to the sun. And then other times we don't have special names uh, that are commonly used for those. But anyone who lives near the coast will figure out pretty, pretty quickly, most cultures have figured out pretty quickly, that the tides roll in and out according to the way the moon operates as well, uh, which makes it really surprising that Galileo missed that. You know, being very, very smart is no guarantee against being very, very stupid at times. Uh, and, uh, and, and everyone, everyone is susceptible to that. So, so and, it, and it's not, and, and I shouldn't say stupid. I, I, I'm, I'm sort of making a joke there. Uh, certainly in my case, I'm considered to be intelligent by some people, and I do stupid things all the time, trust me. Uh, so, so, but, but it takes a while, in, especially in science, to figure out what the patterns are. I'm, uh, again, I, I, I've studied Galileo for 40 years. I am still amazed that he missed that, uh, given the number of other things that he got, and he got right. So, so just goes to show nobody's perfect. But when the water comes in and goes out, it's not just, it doesn't sort of come up and go out uniformly around the world because there are different things that can happen to push more water in or pull more water out. And again, that Bay of Fundy, 
the water goes in and comes out, there's almost 60 feet of difference between the high tide and the low tide. That does not happen in Florida. If that happened in Florida, we would not have Miami. We would not have Jacksonville. We would not have Cape Kennedy. Uh, we, we wouldn't have any of those things along there. But up at the Bay of Fundy on the east coast of uh, Nova Scotia, we have uh, quite the, the depth change because of the way the ocean and the way the island is tilted there. Uh, so, so we have a single high and low tide uh, each day, which is called the diurnal tidal pattern uh, in some places. And then we have the semi-diurnal tidal pattern, which is too high and too low uh, tides each day. And again, that's because the moon is on one side and we get a higher tide on one side, but we get the sort of the bulge of the opposite side when we're 12 hours difference. But again, whether or not we have high and low will largely depend upon whether the water is hitting us north and south or east and west, uh, in, in, a, as well as other factors along the way. So most places will have too high and too low tides, waters each day. Uh, and and uh, those are the main tidal patterns. Uh, so you can sort of see wherever it's blue or red, we're gonna have two, uh, uh, or we're gonna have uh, two uh, tidal patterns where it's green here, but notice we're in this gulf, we're in this sort of enclosed area. And this is showing you where the Bay of Fundy is, which I've mentioned now, what, five times in, in, in our video. Uh, it really is remarkable. And I will put that video up, I promise, uh, so you can see that. So we have flood current, which is stuff that comes in uh, uh, along the coastal zone. Then we have our ebb current, which is seaward moving water, things moving away. Uh, we have tidal deltas, which can be formed. And uh, that's a remarkable thing as well. So that's the ocean uh, area uh, that's there. And we're going to go on to the atmosphere. Uh, one of the things to keep in mind when we're dealing with atmosphere, weather and climate are different. And this is one of the things that makes me want to take uh, talk radio people and just sort of, uh, because whenever it's, when, when, whenever it's cold in the wintertime, they'll say, oh, it's freezing outside. Whatever happened to global warming? It's cold outside. They're making the fundamental mistake between weather and climate. And I just want to like sort of uh, like take them off the air. There should be a stupidity penalty. And they, those people, I will say, are being stupid. And here's why. They're being intentionally stupid. And they're being stupid for political purposes because they are intentionally mixing up weather and climate. As I mentioned before, if you shut off the ocean conveyor belt because the temperature is getting warmer on our planet, that could lead to an ice age. That doesn't mean our overall temperature hasn't gone up. That just means the local aspects of what's happening on the planet are different. And that changes here in Indiana, we know, see, sorry to get, sorry to get emotional. Um, but here in Indiana, we know the weather is constantly changing. But if, it, if we didn't have a stable climate, we wouldn't know, okay, we can grow soybeans here, we can grow corn here, we can grow wheat here, we can pasteurize or, or put out to pasture cows and, and other kinds. There, 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 there are things we can make assumptions about based on climate. And what global warming is, it's not affecting the weather as much as it's affecting the climate. And it's making our weather patterns slowly over time change. Guess what? That's always been happening regardless of whether people are polluting, regardless of whether there's carbon in the atmosphere. The climate has been changing on our planet 100% of the time since we've had an atmosphere, because that's what atmospheres do. When we're looking at atmospheric data, we can look at charts like this. We can see highs and lows. We take averages every now and then you'll say, we've hit a new record, a record high, a record low. Uh, those are usually, especially for places in, in uh, the United States, about 100 to 200 years old at best, because we haven't been keeping the records for that long. We can actually go back in time by doing ice core drilling and other kinds of uh, researches to see what the average temperatures were at other times in the past. We typically can't necessarily see what the record high and record lows were at those. 
But when we're dealing with weather and climate, we're dealing with temperature, humidity, cloudiness, precipitation, that's rain, snow, sleet, ice, uh, air pressure, sometimes it's more pressure, sometimes it's less, and wind speed and direction. All of these things are things that you'll hear on a typical weather report. Uh, our atmosphere is mostly nitrogen. It's uh, the second largest component is oxygen. Notice these two things together add up to about 99%. Uh, so everything else in the atmosphere is only 1%. The carbon dioxide in our atmosphere, notice it includes O2 over here, is a very, very small percentage along the way. That percentage has been going up for the last century. So, so uh, we're, we're used to having a certain mixture. Nitrogen, don't worry about it. Nitrogen's there. Every time you take a breath, two thirds to three quarters of what you just drew in is nitrogen. So it doesn't affect anything. You give it, give it, give it back. Uh, I did a short story for a creative writing class once where aliens were coming to take over the world. And instead of bombing us or lasering us or any other kind of thing, they had a device that changed our atmosphere into laughing gas. How many of you have ever been to the dentist and had laughing gas? It's nitrous oxide, nitrogen and oxygen. So they just took their little device, touched our atmosphere, and everything turned to laughing gas, and we just laughed and laughed and laughed as they took it over. I think they now call that an election. Uh, so, but if we look at our atmosphere, again, here, our nitrogen, our oxygen, and all the rest of the stuff, we've got quite a bit of argon there. Argon, again, doesn't affect anything at all, uh, really. It's a noble gas, and noble gases are standoffish. They won't go home with anyone. They won't take a date to the prom. Uh, then we have other parts of our atmosphere, which include hydrogen and helium, very, very trace amounts uh, that, that, that are there, as well as krypton. Did you know that krypton was an element? Now you do. Uh, so, and neon, just a little bit there. So, so those typically uh, don't hurt anything. You don't want to have huge concentrations of them. Uh, sometimes you can smell the methane in the atmosphere if you're going past the cow pasture. Uh, but as we look at the carbon dioxide, uh, over the course of time, we can see, as we mentioned in the earlier bit, it's 0.405% uh, uh, but it used to be 0.32% uh, and that was just 50 years ago. I was born right about here. All of this has happened in my lifetime. Notice it zigzags up and down. That's because there's more land in the northern hemisphere than the southern hemisphere. So the amount of carbon dioxide taken out of the atmosphere by plants and plant life changes every year from the north and the south being in the summer. Uh, so, so we have almost like breathing, the, the planet is breathing in, out, in, out, but it's going up. And notice it keeps going up and up and up. It slowed just a little bit here, but then it took off again. Guess what? During this period, we had some significant policy changes politically to try to slow things down. Then we got policies that said, nope, we don't want to do that anymore. So yeah, and notice it's sort of ticking up there as well. This is as high a concentration as we have had in tens of thousands of years, perhaps hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, so that is significant because that carbon dioxide holds heat. Water vapor also holds heat, H2O. Uh, this, of course, will change according to whether we have clouds in the sky or whether it's precipitating. And that can be, again, snow or sleet or rain or fog. All of those things uh, count uh, in those ways. Then we have uh, aerosols, and these are tiny particles. They can be solid or liquid. Uh, water vapor is, is an aerosol that can condense uh, on solids. Uh, one of the things that we also see that uh, increase is when we have volcanic eruptions. Uh, that'll put a lot of uh, especially tiny solid particles in the atmosphere, and those will reflect and refract the light that's coming off of the sun, especially in the sunrise and sunset. Uh, so that will change our, that will deepen our colors. Right now, one of the things that's happening is we have quite a bit of partic particulates in the air 
because of the fires in California. That, that ash and dust is actually reaching us here in Indiana, and it's changing the coloration of our, uh, our sunrises and sunsets. You may have heard earlier this year about a big dust storm that was coming over the Atlantic from the Sahara Desert. That actually happens pretty much every year. And we have major dust storms in, in the world. Uh, here we can sort of see a big dust storm coming off of a desert. Uh, this is around China, uh, uh, by the way. This is the Korean Peninsula here. Uh, Beijing is up in this area. Shanghai and other industrial cities are down in this area. So we have lots of air pollution. We've got lots of dust storms that are pushing in. Uh, people in China are used to wearing masks much more than people in uh, the, the North American and European continents because they live with this, especially in Beijing, uh, the dust storms uh, come off of the desert. The Great Wall does not do anything to help that. Then we also have some different things that are in the atmosphere. One of them is ozone, O3. What we breathe in and out is O2, two oxygens, uh, two oxygen uh, uh, atoms together to form a molecule. If a third one forms, uh, it's called ozone. Most of this is high up in the atmosphere and it absorbs most ultraviolet radiation that comes in. During my lifetime again, back in the 80s and 90s, we had these things called CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons, uh, and and uh, one of the things that was happening is anyone who had hairspray, notice I don't need it anymore, anyone who had underarm deodorant spray, anyone who had spray paint, anyone who had air conditioning tended to have chlorofluorocarbons. Uh, refrigeration, refrigerants used to use this quite a bit. And one of the things that was a problem with that is when it got released, it would stay in the atmosphere and float up and it would attack the ozone from underneath. So the ozone was being hit from the UV radiation from the top, but just at a rate where the ozone replenished itself. It was now being attacked on both sides. And that's why suddenly everyone had to wear skin factor protection 5000 to go out into the sun. As you can see me, that affects me quite a bit because I'm so white that I burst into flames when I walk out into the sun in the summer. Spontaneous human combustion. What's that on fire over there? Oh, that's just Professor Kurt Messick. Uh, so, so, so yeah, in the summer, I'm almost always wearing long sleeves and long trousers and hats. You may have seen me with the hat. Uh, there's a reason for that. This is the reason. Fortunately, we've changed the way we manufacture things. Chlorofluorocarbons are not so common anymore and the ozone layer is replenishing itself. It's coming back. And it should be probably more or less back to where it was in another 20 to 50 years. That seems like a long time, but that's actually not very long in terms of nature. But this shows, A, that we do things that affect dramatically the environment, and B, we can do something about it to stop dramatically affecting the environment and things get better. Uh, so, th so this is a test case. Uh, one of the things we can see, for example, over Antarctica, you can say, well, nobody lives there. This is one of the issues, though, is that when it's lesser here, it's actually lesser worldwide. and We have more uh, UV radiation hitting our surface. And of course, if we have more UV radiation hitting the surface where we've got ice and it helps to melt the ice, that can raise the global ocean uh, and that can also create temperature imbalances. So this is actually part of global warming too. This is what's happened over time. But this hole in 2016 is not as big as it was just a few years ago, uh, where it really extended through all of this uh, sort of 30, uh, this, this circle here I believe is the 30 latitude. It extended all beyond that. And now it is, it is beginning to close. It is beginning to close along the way. Uh, we also have pressure changes. We, our barometric pressure, that's one sort of one bar. The air is pushing down on you. Right now, you have 50 or more miles of atmosphere up above you. Mostly, most of the stuff, 90% is within the sort of first 10 miles. It gets less and less and less as you go up uh, along the way. But all of that's pushing down on you at a rate of about 15 pounds per square inch. 
So right now, as I sit here, say I've got nine to 12 inches on the top of my head and another nine or 12 inches on my shoulders, I've got several hundred pounds pushing down. So I'm a weightlifter and so are you, but we're used to it, so it's not unusual. As temperature, as, as we go higher and higher into the atmosphere, the temperature drops, there are fewer particles to hold on to the heat. That's why almost every mountain range in the planet has ice caps uh, if they reach a certain height, if they, they reach sort of three, 4,000 feet or higher, they're definitely going to have ice caps, even if they are on the equator. And if we go further and further and further up, we have uh, very low temperatures and very low air pressures. You can barely breathe at the top of Mount Everest. It's uh, about six miles up, uh, just a little under six miles. And when you're up there, one out of every three people who try to climb Mount Everest die from asphyxiation, from, from lack of oxygen. Uh, if you go up here, as Captain Kinniger did, uh, you would need to take air with you uh, because you would not be able to breathe up there. Uh, you can't really breathe if you're in a, a, a modern jet airplane. Uh, you need to have a pressurized cabin because there's just not enough air there along the way. We live in the troposphere, which is the bottom layer. Notice the word tropic in here. It's the warmer area. Uh, and, and we have uh, a thickness variation that, that happens, uh, but, but usually it's right around anywhere from five to six miles up, so 10 to 12K. Stratosphere takes off from there, temperature goes back up because that's where we have the ozone layer interacting with the uh, uh, UV particles. Above that, we get the mesosphere where the temperature goes back down. Between each of these layers, we end up with what we call the pause. So we go from thermosphere to stratosphere and there's the pause between them. Then, then we have our, uh, our, our troposphere, sorry, to the uh, troposphere to the stratosphere, to the mesosphere to the thermosphere. Uh, that's what it is. There is no well-defined upper limit here. It can actually go all the way. I'm not answering the phone, sorry. Um, well, let's see. No. Um, so, so we are, um, sorry about that, but I glanced over at the phone and it was something that I needed, needed to take. So, so, so there you are. Life happens, life happens. Uh, so, so the thermosphere is the part of the atmosphere that is sort of uh, uh, jagged on the top and a lot of the particles that escape from our atmosphere are actually escaping into that, that, that uh, area. And this is also where incoming particles from the sun will interact with the atmosphere and give us our northern lights that we might occasionally see here in uh, Indiana, although very rarely. Uh, the earth and the sun relate to each other on the basis of the motions of the earth. We rotate on our axis once a day. Uh, how long is a day? 23 hours and 56 minutes? You're right, yeah. There are actually two ways to define a day. One is relative to the sun, but one is relative to just going around on our axis. It takes us 23 hours, 56 minutes to go around on the axis, but it takes us 24 hours as we're going around on our axis to get back to where we are relative to the sun because we're going around the sun at the same time. And this, because we are tilted, gives us a change of seasons because sometimes we're tilted towards the sun and sometimes we're tilted away. You may notice here in Indiana, on our shortest day of the year, the sun is lower in the sky. And on the longest day of the year, it's very high in the sky. And then at the equinox, the equal day and night, we just had that a couple of weeks ago, if you're watching this video in, in the fall, uh, and we have equinoxes in the September and March months and we have our solstices in December and June. Uh, and, and that happens everywhere in the world. But if you're in the Southern Hemisphere, it's opposite. So our longest day is their shortest day and vice versa. But that means the sunlight coming in comes at different angles. And as it comes in at different angles, if you're way up north, it's coming in at a shallow angle. Uh, and and uh, that's called the angle of incidence. That gives you much less energy hitting. Notice we have many more 
rays of sunshine hitting per unit than we have here in Indiana at a mid-latitude and far more than we would have up in the northern areas like Iceland or Alaska. So as I've mentioned before, we're tilted at 23 and a half degrees. We wobble just a little bit. Any planet that is tilted has seasons. Any planet that is not tilted, Venus is not tilted, Jupiter is not tilted, they do not have seasons. It's because as we go around, part of our uh, planet is tilted towards the sun right now. On this graphic, the southern hemisphere is having summer. Notice the northern hemisphere is mostly tilted away. See up here at the pole, as we spin around there, that's 24 hours of darkness. Notice down here around the pole, that's all in light, 24 hours of day. That will be opposite in the opposite seasons. The special days, again, are the solstice days, and the, the sun will be directly overhead at 23 and a half degrees north or south. Then we have our equinox days, where the sun will be directly overhead of the equator. Equator, equinox, equal, equinox, equal night, as 12 hours of daylight and 12 hours of night everywhere on the planet. So as we sort of go around, uh, we talked a little bit about this, I believe, in our, our astronomy section at the beginning of the year. Uh, so I won't go into it too much here. But we do have our, our seasonal changes, many more days of, of uh, sunlight, or many more uh, days with uh, uh, hours of sunlight in the summer, many more days with darkness as predominant in the winter time. So, so you can see how that's tilted. And then at the equinox, it's just 12 all the way around. Although Neil deGrasse Tyson will want me to tell you that it's not actually 12 and 12, because even if the sun goes down, there are rays that come over the edge, and it gives us a few more minutes of daylight along the way. So heat goes from um, obviously warmer to cooler objects. Uh, we get a lot of radiation uh, 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 energy from the sun. Sunlight is radiation, so it's not just sort of the dangerous stuff. Uh, along the way. But we can also get uh, movement and we can get uh, conduction. If I take my hand and put it on something that's cold, what's happening there is we have uh, the, the uh, stuff, the, the, the energy from my hand, which is 98.6 degrees, being conducted into the cooler uh, uh, bottle of, of liquid there. So conduction, again, the hand touching the, 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 the handle there. If it feels hot, that's being conducted. Convection is the motion of the bubbles here. Radiation is coming off of the, the heat that's there. So we have different wavelengths of light. Uh, visible light is the only light that we can see, but all wavelengths of radiation will give off energy that can heat things. Hotter objects radiate more energy. Uh, so that, that's why we sort of burn logs and, and your body actually puts out more uh, stuff in terms of infrared because it's cooler than, because it's 98.6, rather than a, a burning log or, or something uh, like that. And certainly more than the sun, or not as much as the sun. Uh, the sun is far more because it's putting off at its surface temperature 6,000 degrees. But the electromagnetic spectrum here, we've talked about this a little bit in class before, Roy G. Biv with longer wave and shorter wave stuff happening. Uh, we have these different aspects of our radiation that hits us. Some is reflected back into space. We call that albedo. Some is scattered back. Some is absorbed. About 50% reaches the surface of the Earth. And we've seen this graphic before in class as well. 50% reaches the Earth. Another 20% is absorbed by the atmosphere. 20% uh, is reflected back into space. Then we have some that are hitting the top of the atmosphere and just bouncing back. And some from the land sea are going out. So we lose anywhere from 25 to 35% back into space, depending upon how the clouds are. When we look at what we've done on our planet, different things will absorb differently. The wet plowed field absorbs more. Uh, the asphalt absorbs more. That's why it doesn't put out. The lower this number is, the more it's absorbing. So the more it's heating up uh, 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 things along the way. So, so uh, we trap 
infrared radiation with bigger particles, carbon dioxide and water vapor. Uh, we've mentioned that before. And this is called the greenhouse effect. We need a greenhouse effect on our planet because otherwise we would be like the moon. All of the outgoing stuff would just go out and we wouldn't have a, a, a climate at all. We need more than Mars because Mars only has 1% of our atmosphere. So it loses a lot uh, that, that, that's there. If we're uh, looking at Venus, Venus traps almost all of its uh, stuff. And uh, the, the sort of average temperature on uh, Venus is over 500 degrees Celsius, which is pushing 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit day and night. Uh, so, so we do have, as we're recording our, our weather things, as we mentioned before, daily maximums and minimums. We also look for monthly averages and annual averages and average uh, uh, temperature ranges. We look at maps and we see isotherms, which are the, uh, the, the, the loopy drawings that you see on weather maps quite a bit. These would be isotherms here. You can sort of see where we have the different bands of temperature based on what these are. Sometimes you'll see them colored or shaded. Sometimes you will see them uh, in, in things like this. Uh, then uh, we, we see different changes based on where the land and water are. Land heats up more rapidly. So as we talked about in class, uh, San Francisco needs air conditioning much less than Indiana because it's very near to the ocean. Uh, so, so when we're looking here, here's California, here's the Bay Area. Notice the land, very hot, except for this area here. Those are the mountains with the snow-capped peaks. Notice the temperatures down here in the oceanic area. Uh, so, so the ocean cools quite a bit along the way. Uh, when we're looking at Vancouver and Winnipeg, they're sort of right along each other in terms of latitude but Vancouver's right on the coast, so it doesn't go as hot or as cold as Winnipeg, which gets really, really cold in, in the, the winter time and can get really, really hot in the summer along the way. Whereas if we're looking at these two cities, Concepcion and La Paz in Bolivia, the altitudes make a difference. La Paz is in the mountainous regions here, whereas Concepcion is down on the plains. Uh, so we can see the variation in temperature is different there. Uh, so also, if we're looking at things on the Pacific coast versus the Atlantic coast, the Pacific coast blowing, the, the ocean is blowing in towards uh, the, the, the city of Eureka, whereas the wind is blowing away from uh, the ocean uh, in New York City. It's blowing from the continent into New York City. So just being on the coast doesn't do it. You have to be on the right coast, or in this case, the left coast. Uh, cloud cover, as we know, will change temperature, and it'll change it both warmer and cooler. Uh, so so uh, sometimes it can be too cold to snow, whereas if you have a cloud cover, it can, be, uh, it can warm things up enough so that you have snow. Uh, so we see temperature maps and uh, temperature patterns that are fairly well established on our planet. But as we're looking at the north and south, in the southern hemisphere, things tend to be more stable. Uh, isotherms also help us see where the ocean currents are. And we can sort of take a look at these maps. Again, we saw these in our class. You can see in January, lots of cold up in the north area. Uh, pretty calm, some, a few hot spots in the south, in the southern hemisphere. In the summertime, lots of hot spots in the northern hemisphere, a lot more land in the northern hemisphere. And things are pretty straightforward as we go south towards the South Pole down here. So that's it for these chapters. Uh, sorry for the interruption there for a moment, and I look forward to seeing you on chapter 17.